morning, everybody. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with the University of Florida IPIS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Looks like we're going to have a pretty good turnout today to learn all about growing sweet potatoes. So I am not the expert on that topic. So I went and asked the, the, our resident expert on that topic to come here and join us today. Dr. Wendy Mussolini is um, with the University of Florida Extension also. She's a multi-county agent over in Flagler and Putnam County and normally works with commercial growers. So working with homeowners or teaching homeowners, so it's a little bit out of the ordinary for her today, but that'll be fine. If she can teach a farmer how to grow sweet potatoes, you guys can grow them also. And let me throw in really quick, I grew sweet potatoes in Volusia County a few years ago. I got an excellent crop. I had absolutely no problems with them. I had no diseases, no pests. And I got off a small patch, it must've been two bushels of sweet potatoes. So they really are easy to grow. It's definitely something that you wanna include in your garden. So Wendy, let me just go ahead and hush up here and go ahead and turn my camera and everything off and turn it all over to you. Thank you, Bill. This is such an honor and to even be called the resident expert for the sweet potato crop is is just an exciting uh, title for me. I've actually never heard that word <laughs> or heard it put that way, Bill, because um, I am such a fan of this crop. I believe it can uh, save us from world hunger all across the, the globe. And, and so I am a big promoter of sweet potato. And I'll give you a little bit of background on who I am, um, what I've done, what my work with sweet potatoes, just so you kind of understand where I'm coming from. But um, my name is Wendy Musseline and I am a multi-county agricultural agent. And I work up here in Putnam and Flagler counties, which is part of our tri-county agriculture area up here in Northeast Florida. And I was introduced to the sweet potato crop as part of my postdoc at the University of Florida, working with Dr. Ann Wilkie, Janice uh, Bohack, Dr. Bowman. And we were actually growing sweet potatoes to make biofuel with. And so the breeder had developed a specific e-tuber that would get enormously large and lots of packed with starch rather than sugar and very easy to convert into ethanol. And we were trying to scale that up to full scale, but we, um, uh, you know, no one really took that on after a three year project, but we got lots of great publications and I got lots of, uh, I, I learned a lot about working with sweet potatoes because not only did I work with that energy tuber, I compared it with our table stock varieties such as our Covingtons and Beauregards and stuff like that. And then I came into extension and I had the opportunity to introduce sweet potatoes to all of the potato farmers up here in Hastings and actually found a couple potato growers that were really interested in growing potatoes or sweet potatoes because it's a great rotation. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with sweet potatoes. I was in an hour long conversation with NASA a couple weeks ago, me and the breeder and NASA wants to grow sweet potatoes in space because um, when we send uh, researchers up there, they have to eat these MREs for an entire year while they're up there. And so they're trying to figure out sweet potatoes are really easy to grow. So why don't we figure out how to grow them in space? <laughs> so that was a really fascinating conversation. Um, but I think it's an excellent choice for Florida and its subtropical climate. And we'll get into a little bit of, about the climate and we are warm and sweet potatoes thrive in warm weather. They love to be drought stressed. They, they handle it very well. Actually, sweet potatoes bulk up when, when there's drought conditions because those roots are in the ground and they start searching for water. And so they start enlarging and, and trying to reach down into the ground and find that water. And so when it gets hot in Florida, sweet potatoes are in their environment. And um, they also prefer sandy soils, well-drained soils. They do not like wet feet. So we have lots of marginal lands, uh, lots of uh, our farm to fuel project back in uh, my postdoc was focused on 
what about all these citrus groves that are dying across Florida? Wouldn't they make fantastic sweet potato plots? Of course they would because they're very sandy soils and that's what sweet potatoes like. They like it to be well drained and sandy and they don't need a rich organic, you know, beautiful soil. They, they're happy with this sandy soil um, and they're very productive. Um, they have low input requirements. When I talk to my potato growers that are used to putting out Oh gosh, they're up around, they can get up to about 250 pounds of nitrogen per acre on potatoes. And then they hear about the sweet potatoes and they only need 90 pounds. And really the recommendation from UF is 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And so, wow, we are huge savings. We don't have to irrigate them for the most part. We need to irrigate them to get them started. But once we plant them and it starts raining, it, it, it grows the vines and then like I said if they get into a drought condition when they're bulking up it makes them even it makes them perform even better um, they have a good rotation you know I do work with potato growers up here and it is a the timing right okay potatoes are planted white potatoes are planted in January harvested somewhere between May uh, April and May and sweet potatoes could go in right then after potatoes come out and then come out, uh, you know, four to five months later, depending on how long we're going to keep them in the ground. We'll get into that. And in Florida, if they wanted to harvest some early potatoes and put their sweet potatoes in the ground, we could get them in as early as after the first freeze. You know, the farmers often say the first full moon, in, the last full moon in March, which was March 28th. That's when we can start planting our screen, uh spring crops and not worry about frost and so that's really what we would target up here in Hastings is getting our sweet potatoes in the ground early April. Now the challenge is getting slips at that time but um, we'll get into a little bit of that. This is not the first uh, first rodeo with sweet potatoes in Florida. This is uh, an article I found from 1946. There was Clarence Biting actually proposed to put um, a a, a huge facility in for converting sweet potato starch uh, into, you know, for, for just a starch plant. And they actually grew sweet potatoes down there. I found this actually interesting uh, picture of a automated planter where they I assume it was steam driven, but I, I don't know. Anyway, it was six rows and they planted it and interesting bit of history. I'm not a big history buff, but when I found this about sweet potatoes, I got excited. So what we're gonna talk about today in the next 40 minutes is talking about preparing your soil, what kind of fertility program you should consider, how do you acquire slips, how do you make slips, Now I'm unmuted. Okay, uh, what does the planting uh, consist of? What about different varieties of sweet potatoes and which ones should you grow? What does the crop maintenance look like? Let's talk about some harvest and grading. Um, soil preparation, that is the first step. We have to talk about good soil. We talked about soil type, we want sandy soils, we want well-drained soils. And you can see the beds in this particular photograph. They are raised beds. You do not, you have to raise the bed. Um, and this has actually been done with commercial equipment, um, some, you know, major farming equipment, but anybody can do this um, just by piling up dirt, dip, trenching, you know, tilling up the soil and forming beds um, because you definitely need those sweet potatoes when they start to form roots they cannot be sitting in water so you need the beds um, the, the plants to be in a bed like that um, test your soil uh, test your soil test your soil so university of florida runs soil tests for 
for folks, I, I assume, Bill, you probably run your tests, uh, your soil tests in your office in Hernando. Go ahead and get out in your plot and make sure you collect the soil. You want to make sure you have the right pH. And then UF will, if you send them to UF, um, you will, uh, you'll get a fertil fertilization. You'll, you'll, you're, they will figure out exactly how much phosphorus and potassium is in your soil based on what you send them and then they will say okay this is how much nitrogen this is how much phosphorus this is how much potassium you should be adding to your bed and it's always a split application you never want to put all your fertilizer out in the beginning right you want to if they tell you 60 pounds of nitrogen that means 30 pounds prior to planting and 30 pounds about six weeks after planting and and usually the soil lab will will give you those pretty specific instructions but bill you would be able to speak to homeowners a little bit more about landscape and uh soil results and how to interpret those and how much you do in your office and how much they should send them to uf but that's really how we come up with fertility programming for for any crop not just sweet potato um okay slips this is what you start with when you are planting a sweet potato. It's about six to 10 inches long. It's a vine. Oh, ter the terminology is slips. And here's another picture of them. You can see that the slips on the right hand side have started. Oh, oh. I got an automatic. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with the timing there, but anyway, you can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but the roots have started to form because they've been sitting in some soil. And um, once they are in the soil, they do start forming roots. And, and that's not a bad thing. If you want to store the, the slips before they go in the ground and start, start them forming those roots. And then when you plant them, they'll be ready. These are clean slips that were just prepared. You can tell they don't have any slip, any, any root, root mass on any root formation on them, but here you, you start seeing those formations. So, so we prepare our own slips and hastings, and I'm going to just show you how we do that. Um, you can do this on a much smaller scale, but we do this commercially. Um, basically, we make a seed bed. And so we take all of our old sweet potatoes from the year before that have been stored in cool, dry, dark conditions that haven't started sprouting yet. And we line them in the bed. And then after, what is this, February 14th to March 5th, roughly three weeks after we cover them and then they start emerging from the ground. And then another few weeks after that, we start getting a very leafy, green patch of uh of slips and we we make our own so i'm going to show you i got some video of this i think it, it's it, it was fascinating to me how we actually used a potato wagon and we just dropped these practically nine month old sweet potatoes from the previous year into the row and then this was the fun part covering them up so you saw a lot of sweet potatoes go in there and uh, that row is probably about 200 feet long. And I think out of that row, we could get with all those, we, we packed them in really densely for our seed bed. And we probably could pull um, uh, roughly 500 plants out of that, make 500 to 700 slips out of that, that little row that we made. And so it's just a, it, it would be a lot of labor, but if you are interested, obviously you wouldn't have to put out that many <laughs> roots in the ground, but you could take a few root, old roots and put them in the ground and cover them up with a little soil. And you'd want to do this in a warmer, you know, keep them warm because if you want to get them in the ground early. Um, but again, if you're not worried about market potential, you don't need to plant them in April. Um, sweet potatoes grow best in the rainy conditions in the hot weather 
So they're going to perform better if you plant them. I like to say June is a great month to plant sweet potatoes. You could be as early as May, May, middle of May. And I've even gone up to 4th of July and planted them as late as first week in July. What is really important about when you choose your planting date is you want your slips to get established with rainfall. You can irrigate them all day long with uh with aquifer water from the aquifer and they don't do nearly as well as when they get a little bit of rain on them and I think every plant can say the same thing for that so um, once we once we our slip started coming out of the ground we took a um, you probably know one of those hedgers that you would use to it's a it's a mechanical hedger just like it looks like a chainsaw and it has like you know round things on and we we cut those at the base and then we just went and scooped up big piles of this these slips and then we just had a crew in there and we just pulled off leaves we, we always leave the top leaf on because i find that when you leave the top leaf on it promotes the the photosynthesis starts to happen much faster and that plant begins to take root and develop and be better off. So I don't strip all the leaves. I strip all, all the leaves except the top one or two leaves. And I make them roughly six inches to 10 inches long. Um, again, it's they have to be a little bit longer if you're going to do them mechanically versus if you're planting them by hand. They could be five to six inches mechanically, maybe eight to 10, but I'll show you a little bit of, of, of pictures on planting. So this is um, when I was in my doing my postdoc over at University of Florida, we uh, grew sweet potatoes at the energy park over there off of Southwest 23rd Avenue. And uh, we built our own bed as I was sharing. We didn't have any farm equipment. So we did a big, we tilled the, the soil and then we actually made a little raised bed right there. And then we use the uh, like a broomstick, um, the end of a broomstick and just made holes and you want to space the sweet potatoes out every 12 inches. So our rows were roughly 36 inches apart. So we would we had nine rows spaced out center to center 36 inches. And then in between the rows, like when, when you're within your row, you want to plant sweet potatoes every 12 inches and just take that broom. We took a, a long measuring tape out there, laid it on the ground and at every foot, we put a hole in the ground with that broomstick. Boom, 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 all the way down the line. These were 33 foot rows, I think, something like that. And so we put 33 plants in one row and, and we just planted them by hand. And then we took a bale of hay and we put the hay right around it just to suppress the weeds. We weren't using any type of herbicides when we were planting this. They were all grown organically at the at the um, Bioenergy Park there in Gainesville. So we just used hay, um, whatever you need for uh, weed suppression. You don't. Uh, you got to be careful with mulch because you don't want to lower your pH. But I, hay did fine for us. Here's a little bit of a different approach. Um, this is what I use with my farmers, which makes things go a lot faster. We, we can plant about an acre of sweet potatoes in about, hmm, an acre takes us about 20, 25 minutes. So, so we get this done pretty quick. I'm gonna show you how we do that. We use a four row planter here. And all the slips are placed in the wheels by hand. Notice the leaves should be on the top and the roots should be on the bottom. <laughs> Although. So sometimes you have complications. They're not, they don't always work perfectly in these hand planters uh, or mechanical planters. And so we always have two people walking behind the planters. So when one doesn't go in correctly or someone actually drops one or someone actually puts it in backwards, we try to flip it around. Although here's the thing, if you look closely at those slips, everywhere a leaf comes out, um, it's called a node. And as long as you have two nodes in the ground, you're gonna form a plant. 
And that's why I think sweet potatoes grow like a weed because they don't, you could plant these things upside down and they'll still produce. It'll take them a little, a little bit of time. Okay, I got to figure it out, but I still got two nodes in the ground. I got something to make roots out of and the roots will come out of those nodes as long as you have two of those nodes in the ground, they're going to come up. So you can plant them upside down. You can plant them too deep. You can't leave them laid out on the top. You know, if you just drop one and it's laid on the laid flat, it's it's not going to produce. But um, other than that, they really do. They produce very, very easily and come up quickly. So this is we have the Singleton project up here. Uh, these boys grew sweet potatoes, a couple acres for farm to school. They they sold uh, three thousand dollars. $4,000 worth of sweet potatoes to our farm to school programs up here in the Tri-County area. This was a fantastic project. Their dad's a potato grower and these boys learned about growing sweet potatoes. And uh, so we always like to promote alternative crops up here and we love our potato growers, but if we can introduce them to new crops and the sweet potato is not that far off, they are a totally different family and they are as different as night and day. I like to say that the sweet potatoes with the convolvulacea family, whereas the Irish potatoes with the Sol solanacea family, um, and they really are a totally different altogether. They are not related at all. Um, grow differently, different seasons, how they grow. You know, I talk to my 4-H kids and I tell them that the 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 sweet potato it starts with the plant and it grows down you know to to form this these true roots in the ground and there and a sweet potato is a true root um, whereas a potato has tubers that form but you start with that seed piece and it comes out of the ground and the and the tubers form around that seed piece as part of their root system and it just um, if you watch the slow-mo videos of them, you would understand kind of what I'm saying, the top down growing to the bottom up growing. But anyway, they follow behind. They make sure that everything's in a row. Again, how far are these spaced apart? 12 inches. These rows are a little bit further. Um, one is, these are rows, this row, center of this row to the center of this row is a 40 inch row. Uh, you know, when I do them by hand, I make these 36 inch, but with all the commercial farming operations in the Tri-County area, it, they're all 40 inch spacing rows because of the equipment and because of the wheelbase of the equipment that they use. So, but I like 36 inches across and then each, each plant 12 inches apart. Varieties, let's talk a little bit about varieties. Um, lots of different flesh colors, right? got purple, orange, white, yellow. Uh, there are so many different varieties of sweet potatoes. And in my opinion, they all grow well here in Florida. We've grown all these different varieties here at our Hastings Extension Center. Covington's, Burgundy's, Beauregard's, Hernandez, some Scarlet's are all orange flesh. Um, our purple flesh varieties are our Charleston purple. Stokes is out there, um, white flesh. You've got the Boniatas. Um, I don't know if we have any um, uh, Cuban Americans on the call, but the boniata, those white flesh, they're not nearly as sweet, and that would be a typical delicacy, delicacy for um, the, the Cuban American population down in South Florida. They really do like those boniatas. We have a Charleston improved boniata that we've been growing. It still has a breeding line number rather than an actual name because it's still in, in kind of research. Um, there's the palmetto gold, which is more of a yellow. And um, so it really, it comes to preference, what you prefer to eat. I like growing a, a variety. I like growing, you know, three different types of, of fleshes and they, they mature the same, they grow the same, they need the same fertility. What's different about them is taste, okay? Um, and, and, and the look, I mean, clearly the, the purples have a very, very deep hue to them. And when you were, were if you were to boil the purples, like uh, I feed my dog sweet potato a lot. And so if I dice them up and I put them in the pot and they're purple, the entire water, is now this deep purple color. And so then if I were to use that water to make rice, let's say, um, all of my rice would be kind of purple. So it, it kind of adds a little bit of color to the plate, which is interesting. Um, hey, Wendy, I have a question. Yeah. 
Well, we have a number of questions on here, but this one really ties in with what you're covering right now. Okay. Uh, Lena asked, what is the variety that is typically found in the grocery stores, your typical grocery store sweet potato? Covington. Okay. This so I guess that's the one that most of us are yep. used to. This is the NC State uh, son of Beauregard, I call it. Beauregard, they improved the Beauregard to a Covington. And this is the best producer out of North Carolina. North Carolina is the biggest producer of sweet potatoes in the state, in the, in the country. And, um, and their NC State came up with a Covington and it is now was developed by a state program. So it is not any type of protected material. So if you're gonna get something in the grocery store, you're gonna get Covington. That's gonna be most likely. Now, if you do find some of these white flesh, it would be probably close to a boniata. You're not gonna find our new boniatas out there, which are much prettier than the, than the big, ugly, uh, typical boniatas. Um, and then if you're gonna find a purple in the grocery store, you, you're probably not gonna find the Charleston yet. It's something we're working on right now with the breeder. You're gonna find a Stokes purple, which is produced out in California and brought here. Okay. Great question. Great question. And here's some of the differences that you're going to notice besides the taste, because some of them are going to have a little more sugar. Some of them are going to be a little more starchy. For my hash browns in the morning, I love a yellow flesh palmetto gold, and I prefer it over an Irish potato hash brown. It is fantastic. And even the bony autos, I like doing that hash brown with the, with the eggs and bacon in the morning. Um, if you look at, I don't know how familiar y'all are with dry matter content. We use it a lot here just to understand how much moisture is actually in our, uh, in our vegetables. So the Charleston purples are drier, meaning if there's 30% dry matter in our purple, then that means there's 70% water. Whereas with our typical Covington, the typical orange flesh sweet potato, um, even the Burgundies or the Covington, you're going to have 20% dry matter, which means 80% water. And so when you're, you, you're doing that sweet potato, you're baking it, it's going to be a little more moist. Whereas these purple ones, and this has a lot to do with maybe if they fry well, if they're really moist, they might not, they might be soggy when they're fried. If they have a little more dry matter content, these purple varieties might be better for frying them. Um, boniatas are a little more dry and they fry up really well. Um, and, and you can have, I, you can certainly have orange sweet potato fries. I, I think that that's, that's, they're delicious as well. I think they're a great, a great option. Um, but that moisture content does make a difference in how they taste and how they bake and how you prepare them. So that's just something to be aware of with the different varieties. <clears throat> so crop maintenance, let's talk a little bit about it. What do you need to do? You need to get them in the ground. This is a shot of what they're going to look like zero days after planting. This is the day we planted. This is 24 days after planting, so roughly three, three and a half weeks. So you can see um, the growth that, that has happened. And this stage to this stage, these first three to four weeks, you have to keep them weeded you have got to keep the weeds out. And that is a lot of hand weeding. It is very important because these guys cannot outcompete the weeds yet. However, let's look at 47 days after planting. Oh my gosh, you think a weed can penetrate through those, those canopies? Not really. And so that's why I call this a very maintenance free crop because you've got the first three or four weeks where you've got to keep them wet and weeded wet and weeded in the first month. And if you can keep them wet and weeded in the first month and fed, they have to be well fed. You wanna feed them before you put plant them and then split the application and feed them another six weeks after planting is roughly my ad advice is, is six weeks after you plant them, go ahead and give them that second round of fertilizer and make sure they have plenty to do their bulking up when they start bulking and forming that root system. So this is 47 days and this is 101 days after planting. So you see that canopy and there are some persistent weeds in there, but guess what? The weeds that come in after this point, they're, they're not gonna prevent, um, prevent the production. I mean, if you wanna get in there and mess around with them, you're not gonna really hurt the vines 
but just don't take any type of mechanical mower or anything in there at that point. And so the big question is, well, when do we harvest them? Well, the big question is how big do you want your sweet potatoes? Uh, I love it because you can harvest them at 120 days. You can harvest them in 130 days. You can harvest them in 150 days. You can harvest them in 180 days. As long as you don't have any disease pressure or uh, weevil, uh, sweet potato weevil is your big nemesis when you're growing a sweet potato and, and they will find you. We are a weevil state. North Carolina, on the other hand, is a weevil free state, which is why you cannot transport sweet potatoes grown in Florida into North Carolina. Now you can seal them up in a truck real good and send them through North Carolina as long as there's no stopping and opening up anything um, because sweet potato weevil is a very damaging insect and there's nothing you're gonna be able to do as a homeowner to, uh, to be able to kill them because you're gonna need something stronger with pesticide licenses to be able to treat uh, for sweet potato weevil. So my advice is grow them for a few years, make sure you get rid of all your morning glory, which is related to sweet potatoes and definitely try to, um, it, once you start seeing weevils, you'll see little holes that are in your roots. And when you come get them out of the ground, there'll be lots of little, the weevils have, I should have put a picture in the presentation, but they've got this bore and it bores straight into the sweet potato root. And so you'll see all these various holes and you'll know once you get weevils, but we grew them in, in Gainesville for three years in, in the same plot. And after this, the first year we caught maybe one, I don't even know if we caught any weevils. The second year we caught 10 or 12 weevils in our traps and then the the third year we caught about 200 so they they did they did kind of find us and and came along and and got us um but they don't it just depends on how concentrated they get um and how how quickly they um they find you but that's your big sweet potato weevil let's see and, and so my point is you can pull them early if you wanna pull them early, it just, you're gonna have a lot smaller roots. If you wait for 150 days, they're gonna get a little bit bigger. And I think optimum is really what you prefer. Um, these petite sizes here have become a big deal when you go into the grocery store and you see all the different colors and the small petite sizes and, and people like that. So you can dig them by hand. Um, obviously, if you don't have equipment, it's important that you uh, that you use some kind of hoe um, to, to to disconnect the, the the vines from the top and and pull the vines to one side, and then right where the crown is, um, that's where your your bunch of sweet potatoes will be, right under that crown um, for the sweet potatoes. Here's a picture of us actually harvesting them with mechanical equipment, a video, sorry. That's a single row harvester. So each of those rows, we had to go down one at a time. There are 16 rows in a bed. So it took us, <laughs> here we go again. It took us longer to actually harvest the sweet potatoes than it did to plant the sweet potatoes um, because we had to do it one row at a time. And one of the challenges is the vines do get caught up in the harvester and the harvesting and the chain equipment. We're gonna talk a little bit about vine removal at the end. I wanna leave a few minutes for that. After you harvest, you've got a whole pile of them and you gotta sort them, especially if you're doing this for commercial purposes, there are very specific grading standards for sweet potatoes. You, they can be an extra number one, they can be a number one, a number two, or a number one petite. Um, so the main two differences are here, this number one petite, you're between three and seven inches. And then the number one is going to be um, between three and nine inches. So, and, and it has to do with the diameter. So the diameter is going to be a little bit smaller, one and a half to two and a quarter inch versus the diameter here is a number one being one and three quarters to three and one quarter. Um, there are really no, uh, the number twos 
some of the misshapen ones can fall into a number two because there's really no limitation on how long or how wide, how, how much of a diameter they can have. They just have to be a minimum diameter of one and a half inches because sometimes you get these long skinny that are, are just roots that never really bulk up. And so these they look like carrots, which I saved all the carrots and and I call them carrots, but they I don't know, rootlets, carrots, something like that. They're not one and a half inches, but they still have some, some nice flesh in them. And again, I, I made them into dog food. My dog loved them when I mashed it up with his chicken and rice. Here was our project at University of Florida where we did grade them by hand. And you can see the different sizes. Um, uh, and I think we have a coal pile in there somewhere. This might be our coals back here. This was a little out. This guy was a little out of, he, he might not fit anything. <laughs> he was too big. Um, but our, our number ones, number twos, and our petites. This is when we do this mechanically. And at the farm, we put them on a grading line. We've got a list, uh, line of people standing on the grading line. And as that, as that line, this conveyor belt's moving past us, we're pulling off all the coals. And, and not that we didn't get any rotten ones, just the size, the size were, were too small. We had to pull them off. And we have a little sizer here at the farm where. Pretty close to getting them into petites, number ones and number twos. So it makes that process go a little bit faster. But as a homeowner, I can't imagine you're really interested in sizing them since you're not going to be selling them. Curing, uh, you know, a lot of people cure them in the ground. And by curing them in the ground, I mean uh, cut, the, cut the vines off about 10 days before you harvest your sweet potatoes. Go through with some kind of um, something that's just going to trim the vines off, whether like I talked about before, um, a... Um, a hedger or something like that, or just even a clipper and try to clip clip it from that main tap root that's going down to your potatoes. And, and what that does when you cut those vines off seven to 10 days before you actually dig them out of the ground, it allows that sweet potato to uh, thicken the skin around it. And so when you pull it out, happen to hit it with a shovel or something like that, it's going to be a little bit, the skin's going to be tougher. We call it skin set and it's going to be a little bit tougher and it's not going to get bruised so easily and damaged in the harvest process. And, uh, and, and the, the ground is warm and the ground is humid. And so typically if you're in a commercial situation, you have to pull these things out of the ground after you've removed the vines, put them in some type of heater, like a huge room, like a trailer type thing where you have heaters blowing in there and you've got moisture in there you've got 90 degrees fahrenheit 90 degrees or 90 percent humidity you're dark and you want to do that for about a week and though that the curing process changes that sugar to the starch or i'm sorry starch into sugar but what you uh don't I mean, as a homeowner, I don't think that's really important. I think if you keep them in the ground a little bit longer, you've got warm and moist conditions and most, most homeowners don't go through any kind of curing process. And just store them at room temperature. Never put them in the fridge. They're like a banana. If you put a banana in the fridge, it gets, gets, gets dark and uh, brown and it's no good. So store them in, at room temperature, kind of a dark environment, dark, cool environment, and they will last you six months. They store well. Okay, little pet project. I'm going to spend five minutes on this and then we'll open it up for questions. I am a big fan of using the, the vines. They eat the vines in China. They eat the leaves. The leaves have the highest amount of protein in the whole plant. And to discard those, those leaves or the vines, the upper part of the uh, sweet potato is, is just to me a waste. And there's no need to do it because it's a very healthy alternative either for human consumption or for animal forages. And so when you look at, at a harvest index, the roots compared to the roots and the vines is roughly can be anywhere from 40 to 70%. So um, depending on the variety, depending on how well your vines are doing, um, it could be roughly 50% on top dry matter 
compared to 50% on the bottom. Ideally, you want more like 70% on the bottom and 30% on the top, simply because your bottoms are your, your money producers. But to know that you're always going to have a top that you can do something with. And this was a, a publication that I, I did with my professor back in 2017, talking about the dual purpose advantage of industrial sweet potatoes using the vines. And even when I went into extension, I got with some cattle folks and said, look, this, there's a lot of wonderful uh, vines, uh, animal forage here, opportunities. And when you compare it to what the cattle are already eating, the Bahia grass and Bermuda grass, crab grass, I mean, we're right there. The sweet potato vines, first of all, yields in tons per acre, typically always is going to exceed a, a, a summer, um, an annual perennial grass or a perennial or an annual grass. Crude protein contents are very comparable, if not higher, and total digestible nutrients are comparable, if not higher, for sweet potatoes when you compare them to some of the other forages that our animals are eating. And I'm not going to get into that because you don't really care about the nutrient requirements of a lactating beef cow, but what you understand is 11%, 62%, well, guess what? We got plenty of that when it comes to our sweet potato vines. Um, and the other project that I looked at was looking at the vines that does the nutrition of the vines change at different maturity stages at 122 versus 134 versus 152 days after planting. And what we found with crude protein, uh, it changed. It went down a little bit, but we're only talking a couple percentage points. And when we look at that lactating beef cattle, what he really needs, it's right up here around 11%. So 11%, 11%, oh, okay, we're getting a little low on 152 days. The TDN did not change at all across those maturity levels. This is a cool video. This is actually vine removal on a commercial sweet potato crop. This was used, used to be, I think, a, was bought from a tobacco farmer. And these set of rollers goes through and disconnects those vines. And without pulling the entire plant out of the ground, we're actually able to disconnect the vines from the crop using this piece of equipment. I tell you, farmers up here, they're just so creative. I love it. And then after we disconnect the vines in order to make it useful for cattle, we brought a big round baler in and bailed it up into a bale <laughs> and, uh, and fed it to the cattle. So that was a fun little project. I think it's worthwhile. There's still some, some situations that need to be worked out because this is a very wet bale and we need to get this wrapped immediately so that we don't, you know, have a problem with uh, immediate explosion or burning to fire. Uh, anyway, that's a long story, but could catch on fire. So I'm going to open that up to questions. We've got about 15 minutes left. If y'all have any questions, I'm sure I missed plenty of things that homeowners might be more interested in than my little pet. Oh, we got a bunch of questions on here for you. That was great. Boy, I learned a lot myself and I'm definitely going to be putting sweet potatoes in the garden this year. I was thinking about it, but now I'm definitely going to do it. Oh, good, 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 good. So a few people asked very early on, going back towards the beginning, what is the um, pH? What's the ideal pH for sweet potatoes? You know, that's something that the UF lab, I haven't even looked at a soil report recently, but they're going to have that number. And I think it's going to be roughly around six and a half. But I would have to look at a soil report to be definitive on that. I know for the vast majority, for general vegetables, it's 6.5. Yeah. And 6.5 is kind of, um, and this all depends on where in Florida or the country you're listening to us from, mm -hmm. what your average pH is where you live. 6.5 is pretty average. Um, and Wendy mentioned earlier about soil testing. I know that here, if you're watching and you live in Hernando County, Florida, we offer soil testing here through our office. We don't do the testing here. We send it all up to Gainesville to the soil testing lab up there. In other counties in Florida, they'll actually do pH tests right there at their office. We're not able to, so we send it all off. But the um, 
current price for a soil test sample right now, I think is $10. Just send a small sample off to Gainesville and a week or two later, they send you back your results. So definitely worth the money. And so you they can contact have a, our yeah, office or any extension office for more details about that. Yeah, and they have that pH set on. If it's 6.4 or 6.2 and you're low, then they'll give you an actual recommendation for add a little bit of lime to your soil to raise your pH and they'll give you that rate. You know, they'll give you exactly how much lime you need to add to raise that pH because they they evaluate it. But I, like I said, I don't know if it's 6.4, 6.7, 6.5, you know, the soil test will tell you that exactly. Yeah, and don't assume that you need lime in your soil. I know we have a lot of people moving to Florida from other states where maybe they did that all the time. Here in Florida, here in Hernando County, we have a lot of people with very high pH. Okay. And if you add lime to it, you're just going to make it a whole lot higher. You don't want to do that. Right. right. You want to get a soil test first yeah. and then add amendments second. That's right. And... Um, Lauren asked, what is the best storage for the potatoes to be able to last as long as possible? And I think you touched on that just on a counter inside your house. Cool, dry, dark, maybe even a cupboard because you don't want them in any light because if you put them where they're by a window by the light, they will start sprouting. They'll start growing those, those slips as I showed you. And so you want them in a cool, dark area um, definitely, I don't know if you noticed the crates that I had in that one, you know, those milk crates, you want them to breathe. You don't want to, potatoes, you just see how those crates are breathable. You want them stored in something like that. And we put them in a, in a dark kind of room that was climate controlled, you know, that wasn't super humid after they were, came out of the ground and they stored for six months. And then we ran starch on them again and they really didn't lose any of their starch. So they will hold pretty well. And now if they have defects on them and they're scarred, you don't want to store them, you know, because if they start rotting in that one spot, then they spread the rot to everything else. So just take a good look at them, make sure they're protected on all sides and they're not, you know, use the ones that are scarred first and then keep, hold the ones back that don't have any blemishes on them. And they'll, I'm telling you, six months, three to six months easily. Okay, and going back to the ones that you planted to get slips off of, how deep did you plant them? Um, well, you saw we just put them in the ditch. It was probably four inches, and then we covered them with with soil. So, um, you know, like a typical seed potato, four inches of b below the the ground surface. Okay. Yeah. Is there any for them to come up and and start forming some roots? Okay, is there any benefit to planting old sweet potatoes over the slips? So planting, I guess, whole potatoes. Okay, so that's what we did. You plant the old potatoes and they make the slips. The old potatoes won't turn into new potatoes. They will only generate slips. And then there's no, you know, then they don't really, then you have to cut those slips. And But you could, from one potato, you might be able to cut four or five slips. So from one old potato, you let the slips come out of the ground and you could recut them three times. I didn't mention that in the thing, in the presentation, but you could let them grow up, cut a slip or two, and, and then you could let them grow up again and let them grow up a third time because those old potatoes will just keep allowing those slips to come out of the ground. And so typically on a commercial situation, we will cut those slips three different times. Okay. Kat asked, could you comment about growing sweet potatoes in a cattle panel wire tower? Um, probably the way that some people will grow potatoes. I grow potatoes in a tower with layers of hay and straw and soil. A tower will have about three or four levels of plants. So it's kind of, um, and I've seen, um, you can actually purchase like baskets or buckets online. Or if you make something, if you picture, make a circle of chicken wire and you plant either the potatoes or sweet potatoes at the bottom, as they grow, you throw more soil on. As they grow, you throw more soil on. That way, when it comes harvest time, you just unclip the chicken wire and the potatoes ideally spill all over the ground. I know that people can grow regular white potatoes that way. 
I don't see why you couldn't, um, but you're going to have to start out with something, you know, some kind of base where you can, where you're going to be able to add those slips into the ground mm -hmm. uh, or into the, the baskets. So you're going to have to have a solid enough foundation. I, I can't exactly, I've never really had a vertigo system with sweet potatoes in it, so I can't speak to that. Um, but as long as you had something solid enough for the slips to, to, to get in and start to take root in, I, I don't, you know, and then you need the volume. I would never say grow them in anything less than a seven gallon container to allow them to bulk up. Because again, after 140, 150 days, if you leave them that long, you could, you could harvest them after 120. I think that would be the least amount of time I'd give them. Um, but 120 to 150 days, um, you're going to want I, I would never tell anyone to put it in a five gallon container. I'd say seven would be the mo the minimum volume that you're going to want. Okay. And David asked, what varieties and differences are found in Central Florida like Bushnell? I guess the, Bushnell would be very, very similar to your part of Florida. Absolutely. Similar. Central Florida. Yeah, yeah. I think when you get down to South Florida, you're going to find a lot more of the bony otters just because of the population and what they want. But we, you can grow the varieties that I showed here throughout the entire state. Matter of fact, we have a pro, we have a grant program, and we in as of May fifteenth, down in Indian River, we're going to plant twenty varieties. Up in Hastings, we're going to plant twenty varieties, and up in Live Oak, we're going to plant twenty varieties at each of the research research stations across the state of Florida. We're going to plant the exact same 20 varieties at each location. And so we'll have a little bit more of an information of which ones might do well in different locations, but I'm gonna say they're gonna perform pretty much the same based on the climate across the, the state. Planting dates might vary. As it's warmer in Florida, May 15th may be a, a little bit of a late planting date for South Florida, whereas for us, it may be perfect. In Live Oak, it may be a little early. They'd like to wait till June 15th. So that may vary the planting date across the state, but varieties is going to be the same. Okay, Farella has kind of unusual question here. What causes that bad taste in sweet potatoes? Are they too old? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're starting to go rancid. And, and I know what you're talking about. They smell and they taste horrible, bitter. Ugh. Just too old or they came out with a little bit of disease on them. Um, soft rot, something like that. The flesh turns dark like a regular potato. The flesh turns dark or mushy or something like that. Okay. Um, and we have a couple questions about the um, sweet potato weevils. One of them is, are you using pheromones to catch them? And is there anything that eats weevils? So is there any beneficial insect that's going to help keep your sweet potato weevils under control? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yes, it, we definitely use pheromone. And there's specifically a sweet potato weevil pheromone that you use. And you just mount it in your traps and put some sticky paper in there and you'll catch them. Um, I do not know if there's any beneficials that attack sweet potato weevils. I want to say no, simply because there are such avid programs across our big sweet potato states like South Carolina and North Carolina and Louisiana, Mississippi, that are so avid. I mean, they keep such a close eye. And if they find a weevil anywhere, that area is quarantined. Um, and so I want to say it's a very difficult treatment. And definitely, if there's any beneficials, I'm not aware of them. But if you find out any, I'd love to know. I'm sure there's people working on that. And weevils are going to come from a immature weevil. And I assume the grubs are going to live in the soil. Do the grubs feed on the sweet potato roots also? Do you know? I don't know if they do. I only think that I've only seen the damage from a fully grown weevil because they, like I said, they have that snout that comes out and they bore mm -hmm. holes into it. So I've never seen um there's some wireworm damage that happens that's a totally different uh pesticide or a pest um but I, i've never seen i don't know that the larvae have a problem or create a problem with the sweet potato 
My guess is they're probably using it, looking at using beneficial nematodes to help control the grubs. But I don't know that for sure. I'm, I'm sure that, that somebody's working on that. It's not me. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of microbes in the soil. So if you can get your uh-huh. hand on some beneficial microbes, use them. That organic trial I showed you some pictures of, we did not use any pesticides and uh, we used microbes. I know people who like to grow or if you're interested in growing more food organically, pick things that are gonna have very few problems to begin with. Things like sweet potatoes and during the winter, radishes and carrots, they don't have any problems. If you focus all on cucumbers, you're gonna to have to use a lot of fungicides on that. Or tomatoes. <laughs> or tomatoes, yeah, there's no way around it. They, they no have way. a lot of problems. You're gonna to have to use something to control that. So pick crops yeah. that are just really pest free and easy to grow. Exactly. And we had a question, what was that time frame of cutting the vine before harvesting? I like to cut them at least seven days, seven to 10. And if you leave them, if you leave the sweet potatoes in for two weeks after you cut the vines, no harm done because they're just curing. Um, What you don't want to see is a ton of rain right before harvest. You really don't, that's where you can get into a situation where if it's going to rain and you're going to, if you're, you got a hurricane coming and you're going to get a lot of two, three inches of rain, let either get them out of the ground before that hurricane comes, if they're at 120 days or let them keep their vines and go past it because a flooding situation in the end will destroy a crop. Because again, they're, they have wet feet. The whole, those roots will get wet and sit in that moisture and it's no good. That's why you need those sandy soils to let that moisture drain out quickly and you want them to be going after the water in the soil. So yeah, seven to 10 days. Um, but think about your weather pattern. That's gonna be more important in terms of determining your harvest than your size. Okay, we have kind of a follow-up question here. Can you harvest the vines a little at a time, just taking off leaves to use as food? And how much of the leaves can you take off and not harm the plant? Well, you're going to stunt the growth. If you're going to harvest uh, the vines at any point before it's mature, you're going to at some point stunt them. But it depends on how much. Uh, I don't think you're going to have a noticeable um stunting when you get 140 days after planting let's say 130 days after planting those vines some of those vines are going to be up to anywhere from 10 to 12 feet long you're going to have some really long strings like that and the healthiest part of that vine is going to what we call the vine tips it's the last two feet or last foot and a half of that vine so go to the end of it cut that tip off and that's what you're going to want to eat. And so, yes, you can do that throughout, but if, if you do it early on and you take that two feet and there's only two feet of vine, then you're going to really stunt your growth. Um, Not to say it will not continue to grow. You're not going to kill the sweet potato. And I know people in Africa that only grow sweet potatoes for the vines. They put their roots in the ground and they leave them in for six, eight months and they cut the vines as they come out, cut them, and they only eat the green part of the plant because of all the protein and nutrients and that are in that part of the plant. Um, so you're just not going to ever bulk up and get a really nice set of, of roots in the ground if you keep doing that. Okay. Are the vines fed fresh to livestock or are they dried like grass hay? That's what we're trying to come up with. They, um, we're trying to uh, wrap it because we cannot dry the, the, the vines out enough before we need to bale them. We need to bale them wet. And so when, because we're baling them wet rather than letting them dry out in the sun, um, and making it complicated. It's much easier using that baler to keep them, to, to bale them while they're wet. We would need to wrap them and let that fermentation process happen. So it's like a fermented hay or fermented feed is going to be our approach for feeding. But this is kind of, again, all of, um, this is not done at all commercially yet. 
<laughs> this is a project that I've been working on and trying to promote um, to, to my folks, um, but uh, it has to it has to take off. But that's that's the concept is wrap them wet, wrap them in plastic or bale them wet, wrap them in plastic, let them ferment and then four months down the road, because again, Cows don't need food in the in the summertime. They do have plenty of pasture grass. When do we when do the cows need most of their food is when they're given birth and the wintertime when all the grass is dead. So if we wrap them and bale them for 190 to 120 days and then open that bale up, sweet, sweet fermented feed forage. Okay. And we have a question about if you plant the sweet potatoes from a store purchase plant. Are the sweet potatoes edible? Yeah, I, they are. And are there any sweet potatoes that are poisonous or inedible? Any varieties, I guess, or types? I mean, I don't know about wild types um, because I haven't really ever seen any, but no, not that I'm aware of. Morning Glory is a sweet potato plant and it might have a bulb on the end of it that you wouldn't want to eat, um, but that's that's technically not sweet potato. It's It's in the same family. Um, it's like a climbing vine that may have a little bit of a, a knob on the end, but not that I'm not that I'm aware of. No poisonous types. Yeah, and we have a number of yams introduced and invasive and native in Florida, some of which have very edible roots. Uh, they grow them a lot in the Caribbean for food crop. That also includes the invasive air potato. That's why I know that I work with air potato a lot. Um, we don't recommend eating that. It tastes terrible. Um, to the best of my knowledge, none of them are poisonous, but if you stick with the different varieties that you find at the grocery store, you'll be safe. Definitely. And then where can you buy slips? Yeah, that's a challenge. You'd have to go out of state, um, and go to some, you know, Google sweet potato slips in North Carolina. Um, there are going to be some folks that will, will sell slips and send them to you in bulk. Um, oftentimes they take time in the mail and they can get to you and they're not in great condition. So growing or buying slips can be a challenge. I don't know anywhere in Florida where you can actually go and buy them. I know, oh, Mark Bailey in Ocala, he came and got a lot of seeds from me and started his own seed bed and just for his own program, for his oh, own wow. county agents, he he ended up selling slips. Yeah, it was a great little project he had. You'll have to ask him about that. Um, That's great. Yeah, Mark Bailey is with um, Marion County Extension. So look online and go ahead and shoot him an email. Maybe he's gone into business raising sweet potato slips <laughs> on the side. <laughs> I know he said it went really well and he had lots of people that he got started in sweet potato and that's something we would certainly be happy to do in Hastings as well, especially after we get all our slips for this project we're doing this summer, the seed it fund. So, hey, great way to earn some extra program money, right? There we go. Um, I know that you can buy them from a lot of seed companies, all of which you can find online and they're happy to send you uh, catalogs. Finding seed companies that will send them to you for the right, at the right time of year here might be a little bit tricky. And I know that they sell out pretty quickly, so you have to order them early. So try looking online. You'll be able to find them for, for different varieties online, probably. And Lee says he's grown sweet potatoes in Broward County, and his soil is between 6.5 and 7.2 pH. So that sounds fine. And Nora asked if they could be container grown and you said needs at least seven gallon. The bigger the container, I would assume, the better. The bigger, bigger the better, yeah. yeah. No need to limit them. And Lee said Boniato also does great here in Broward County. I know that's, um, people are a lot more interested in growing some of those tropical vegetables because here in Central Florida, not a whole lot you can grow in the heat of summer. Okra, black eyed peas, that's about it. And sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. um, here's a good question. How many pounds of potatoes will each plant generally produce? Anywhere from, I mean, it depends because that changes with your maturity date. But if you let them go out to full maturity around 150 days is my kind of what I say full maturity 
again, you could harvest them at 120, but if you harvest them at 120, you might get half the weight as if you waited another 30 days to harvest. So that really does depend on when your harvest date is, but um, from one slip, you can get anywhere from three to 10 pounds of sweet potatoes. Wow. Because you're going to get from one slip, a, a nice slip, you're going to get five or six tubers uh, roots. And Lena asks, is there a particular variety that you know of that's better to grow for the greens? That was my publication. We we evaluated um, Hernandez, Beauregard, and then our energy tuber. And honestly, statistical differences, we, I mean, all the leaves had very high protein. I mean, you could take a look back at that, that publication and get some very speci precise numbers on the different varieties producing different nutritional values. Um, let me pull that slide back up just so you may want to look up that publication. Um, but Statistically speaking, no major differences with your um, different varieties for vine uh, maturity or vine nutrition. Anything else out there? We know we're getting past 11 o'clock. Sure, we got just a couple more here. Um, so I guess the best thing to do if you do have a problem with weevils is to rotate. Rotate. Rotate okay. your land, absolutely. And Matthew <laughs> says, thank you so much. It's very informative. I thought it was informative too, because I'm I'm not the expert on sweet potatoes. And Lauren has a good plant-related question. How is morning glory related to sweet potato? They're in the same family, and they really, uh, one is kind of a, people grow it for ornamental, and then one actually grows an edible, an edible, but they're in the same family. They're like the same. They're kind of like industrial hemp and marijuana. One has THC and one doesn't. They mm -hmm. look the same. I mean, it's really hard to tell the difference. Morning Glory looks exactly like a sweet potato vine. It's just not going to have a, an edible root at the bottom. I know this, the leaves are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And Kat says, we were talking earlier about um, uh, the slips. Yes, we can get slips in Marion County. I think they, the master gardeners up there sell it for a fundraiser. I'm not sure, but I think they do. And Linda asks, can you buy slips in North Carolina and transport them yourself to Florida? Yes, I don't think there's a problem going from North Carolina to Florida. There's a problem going from Florida to North Carolina because Florida is a weevil state. We have mm -hmm. weevils and it's clearly, every county pretty much has declared a weevil, a weevil area for the state of Florida, all the whole Florida. Um, certain places like Georgia might have a few counties that are weevil free and other counties that, are, that have weevil, you know, other, other states might be split, but Florida, it's not a problem bringing them. Okay, we have more information here about uh, purchasing slips Kat says, she obviously lives in Marion County. You can order them now, but you have to pick them up at the county extension in April. And then Kathy asked for the contact information. Kathy or anybody else, if you look online under University of Florida Extension in Marion County, go ahead and find their website. And it's Mark Bailey that's doing it. If you call their office, they'll put you in touch and give you the information about how much the slips are, how many are in a bundle, when you have to order them by, how you can order them, when you have to pick them up, so they can help you with all that. And here, yeah. if you if you do want to take a closer look at that um, that vine paper that I, that we wrote, just Google feed and fuel sweet potato, all one word. You could put my last name up there, Musseline feed and fuel sweet potato, you're going to come up with that publication. And it'll just give you a very specific breakdown. You'll be able to look at iron, magnesium, calcium. I mean, we did the gamut. We sent those samples off to Dairy One for analysis, and they did a really 
big overhaul on the nutritional value of the different uh, vines. And I go into the significance of each nu of nutritional component of the vine. So it's a pretty in-depth paper. Okay, for anybody who's interested in eating the vine part. And I think we're gonna go through, let's say two more questions here. Okay. Carol, Carol asks, can I grow sweet potatoes in a raised bed is 11 inches deep enough? So it's 11 inch in a raised yep. bed deep enough for them. I didn't even tell you that, but yeah, I target 12 inches. Okay. Yep. I target 12 inches and then I take that broom handle and make the hole and you take that broom handle and hole down about three or four inches deep. And then you put slip, put your slip in as long as two nodes on that slip is under the, under the soil, you're going to be great. Just pack that soil in around those slips. Tw 11 inches is fine. I target 12. High. Okay. And a couple more questions here about weevils. So morning glory will attract the weevils and how do the weevils spread? Uh, Bill is in a remote rural area with no fields nearby that he knows of. How would they find our plants? And I know the answer to that because insects are amazing at finding food. They have <laughs> really good nose as they sniff things out they are amazing i thought we've never grown sweet potatoes in gainesville at our energy park and after two and a half three years there they were they all came they brought their buddies <laughs> <laughs> they'll do that and sometimes it'll take a year or two or three for them to figure it out but insects smell a lot of chemical cues you know, bark beetles will find a sick or damaged or stressed pine tree, and sweet potato weevils will find a sweet potato. Cabbage loopers, the moth will find your cabbage plants and lay eggs on it. It might not happen immediately, but if you keep growing them in the same spot year after year, they will find it and you will build up a problem. That's why it's a good idea to rotate your crops because that way you don't have a permanent buffet there for the weevils. And if you only grow sweet potatoes some years, the weevils, it's going to make them hard, harder to find for the weevils. You're not going to have as big of a problem. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's pushing about 11.15. So, um, Wendy, I think it's probably about time to wrap it up here. We got a lot of uh, thank yous for a very good presentation, very informative. I thought it was great, too. Good. It was fun. I was glad to put it together and glad to share the things I've learned about this crop. Uh, my intentions are to go to East Africa and work with them with sweet potatoes, hopefully in my future. Because I do think in Uganda, they eat a morning, noon, and night. It's their main staple. So I would love to take a few of our newer varieties that we've been working with over there and, and figure out how to feed the world. Because I do believe sweet potatoes can, can feed the world. That's great. Well, hopefully everybody that watched today is going to at least feed their families with sweet potatoes <laughs> this year and, and work it into their variety of things that you can grow in your backyard. And you see, people move here from up north and they say, gosh, you can't grow anything in Florida. So you can grow a lot here. You just have to know when to plant it and how to go about it. So 